single detail you need to know about this rapidly unfolding case. Stay with us tonight. Also, the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, orders immediate activation of standby force in Niger after the sub-regional bloc held a meeting in Abuja earlier today. We speak to sources close to the meeting tonight. Also, uh, the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, issues a flash flood warning to residents in and around the northeast region of the country, cautioning them to be ready to move to higher grounds following floods earlier today. We have all the videos of this rather unfortunate incident, the flooding earlier today in that part of the northeast region. We have NADMO joining us and some exclusive videos as well of the level of devastation as a result of this floods here on Ghana tonight. Also, in th we're just getting information coming through. The International Monetary Fund has also been responding to the Bank of Ghana losses. We'll tell you about it. Connect with us. We're very, very interactive. The hashtag is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. I am Alpha the Council. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The Office of the Special Prosecutor has confirmed seizing over 2 million CDs and $590,000 from the residence of former Sanitation Minister Cecilia Dapa. The revelation was captured in court documents filed by the Special Prosecutor seeking to affirm and prolong the freeze of assets of the embattled former minister. The U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Virginia Palmer, says Ghana will send a wrong signal to investors if it goes ahead to pass any laws that discriminate against the LGBTQ community. Ghana's anti-LGBTQ bill is at the consideration stage to, among others, criminalize the promotion, advocacy, funding, and acts of homosexuality. Ghana is a very welcoming tolerant society, lots of inter-religious harmony, a lot of inter-ethnic harmony, and that makes Ghana strong and stable and attractive for investment. I hope it stays that way with regard to the LGBT community. And again, there's money to be made, you know, the color of your money is green or red if it's Ghanaian, that Ghana is less welcoming than I'm telling people that it is now. ECOWAS has ordered the activation of its standby force. The regional bloc, after its extraordinary summit in Abuja, indicated that all options, including the use of force, remain on the table to restore constitutional order in Niger. Earlier, Chairman of ECOWAS, President Bola Tinubu, said diplomatic routes will be explored to ensure a swift return to constitutional order in Niger. Niger's military junta had defied an August 6 deadline to step down and return the country to constitutional rule. The junta instead closed Niger's airspace and vowed to defend the country against any foreign attack. <music> Onion prices in Bogatanga and Binduri have increased due to the Niger coup, causing over 40 trucks to get stuck at the borders. Marketers predict a drastic shortage of onions in September if the situation in Niger remains unchanged. And they also, and they also farm and kept it, so they are, not, they are, they are selling it at a, at a very high price because if they also are very high, afford to buy and then they cease. But that is, and they, they, and they cease to then cease. They see Hong two thousand. So when they sell it and buy the seed, you see what's the situation now? To affect us, to affect us. If you normal farm and farm but you now we farm, but still it will be sorting. So we farm then we we don't even know where they are going to get onion to to prove. The Deputy Director General of the Commission for Technical and Vocational Education and Training, Engineer Peter Intribusiakon, has urged tertiary institutions to reduce admissions for students who enroll in less demand-driven programs. He made the observation at a forum for senior high school students in Cape Coast. The unemployment situation we have in this country is partly due to um, some of the programs offered at our, our traditional universities that are not on demand and for that matter we as uh, regulators we should um, regulate um, the programs they offer at, the, at some um, universities if they are not on demand if it's not industry-led and demand-driven 
then we have to cut down the number of students we enroll them to study. Well, you can find more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. There's a story we're following quite closely and is developing as well. The Northeast Regional Secretariat of the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, uh, has given an advice to the population around the Northeast region to be on the alert and be ready to move to higher grounds following the flash floods that occurred this morning. The videos you are seeing are from some of our viewers in, in this particular area, the northeast region, hit by the floods. Uh, earlier in the week, we got to know that Wale Wale was heavily hit and most of the, that part of the community were also affected by the floods as well. And that really has generated some concern about what is going on. And we're keeping a close eye on this particular situation and be updating our viewers on it as well. And that's a situation that we're keeping a close eye on here on Ghana tonight and how things are unfolding quite swiftly with respect to this particular situation. So that's what's happening now and then also the issues relating to the flooding in Wale Wale. And we would get some details on that shortly here on Ghana Tonight. Remember, we're also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279. We're all across the world on 3news.com. That's what's happening right now in the area. And we'll be connecting with the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, shortly. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, we stay on the ongoing investigation by the Office of the Special Prosecutor into the Cecilia Dapa stolen money saga. As a court document available to us reveal more cash was found at her residence. We give you every single detail of what the Special Prosecutor found tonight and rather very very interesting developments but my colleague Eric Mauna Egberta earlier put everything in summary and 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 it just put it all uh, just for the benefit of our viewers but shortly we'll get to some single details uh, with my colleague Dennis Barberi Wedam who's been studying the special prosecutor statement which was released earlier today plus some exhibits as well uh, so that for you our viewers you can also follow through every step of the way. This is a summary of the reports that we're going to get into the details of shortly. Take a look. As confirmed by court documents, the Office of the Special Prosecutor has frozen the account of former Sanitation Minister Cecilia Benadapa. What is becoming evident is that all seven accounts belonging to the former minister with both Societe General Ghana Limited and Prudential Bank Ghana Limited have significant amounts of money which cannot be touched or accessed by the former minister. What has been revealed further in these documents by the Office of the Special Prosecutor currently in court is that bank accounts with Prudential Bank Ghana Limited, up to four separate accounts exist with different sums of money in both cities and in dollars. With Societe General Ghana Limited, up to three bank accounts exist in the name of Cecilia Benadapa with CDs investment and some cash resting comfortably. What the court documents further confirm in relation to ongoing investigation by the Office of the Special Prosecutor is that the search at the three residential homes of Cecilia Benadapa in July of this year indeed discovered a lot more cash. According to the document, the offices of the special prosecutor discovered up to 590,000 US dollars in hard cash and up to 2.7 million cities in hard cash as well at the Abelengpe residence of the former minister. 
what this means is it does confirm the reportage we brought to you here at TV3 of a lot more money found in the home of the former minister. What awaits now is the hearing which is scheduled on the 17th of August of this year for a determination as to whether or not the financial division of the Accra High Court will continue to give the special prosecutor the authority to have these seven accounts frozen until investigations are done. Well, so th this is a summary of this report by the OSP. What we're going to do now is to give you some singular items which we've been able to glean just for you, our viewers, to follow every step of the way. Why what the OSP has put out to gate is extremely important to how this case is playing out. And we're getting to know that there are not just two residencies of the former sanitation minister, Cecilia Depa. We're talking about three residencies now and then plus some more money that was discovered in her house. If you recall, the earlier report was that something substantial had been found. Well, there's some confirmation to it. And that also confirms an earlier report that we here at TV3 put out. My colleague Dennis Barberi with them is, is ready with some more detail. Dennis, what have we found in this OSP report that was released today? Well, so Alfred, the updates on the Office of the Special Prosecutor's investigation into the matter of Cecilia Dapa has almost become like a weather report. Yeah. We do it daily. And now it, 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 There's a new development every kept single you day. kept awake for the past three days. And but well, it's, it's important for us to know the money that is involved and how all of the money is played out. And for our viewers to understand it, we've decided to put the money into three categories. Mm. The money that was allegedly stolen, which okay. we have spent a lot of time explaining to viewers, and that includes the $1 million, which um, part of it, 800,000 US dollars plus 200,000 US dollars, then some 300,000 euros. Mm -hmm. That's the money we are talking about. That's right. And that was the money that was allegedly stolen from her home. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning so of yes. the story. Now, the other part of the money is what we earlier reported, that the OSP, upon arresting the minister or the former minister, conducted a search in her houses, three houses, one at Abelengui, mm -hmm. the one where the incident itself happened, right. one at Cantonment, okay. and then one at Tesano. So this is the third house we're the getting house, to know, yes. because earlier the, the, the report suggested two residences. So yes. the Tesano house is the, the latest. third one. Okay. So upon being arrested, um, put under investigations for corruption and corruption-related offenses, the search revealed that some 590,000 US dollars was found in the residence, the one at Abelimpe. Mm -hmm. Then there too, there was another 2,730,000 Ghana cities also found at the same residence. I see. So when we reported that money was found and they spent a lot of time counting the money, mm -hmm. this has come to confirm that indeed it had to take them some time to count all of this money. I see. Now we know this money has been seized by the special prosecutor on the basis that he has strong suspicion that it is tainted money. Okay. And per the OSP Act, once somebody is under investigation for corruption corruption related offenses mm -hmm. or the person has been charged and the OSP suspects that the money is tainted, he has the right to do what he did. So this money, $590,000, Yes. 2,730,000 CDs is in the custody of the OSP. That is what we, are, we, we gather. Okay. The last part of the money, so this is the second part of the money. Mm -hmm. The last part of the money is what um, we are now being told the OSP is heading to court to confirm a freezing order that he's placed on this money. This yes. money is money that is seated in the bank accounts of the former Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources, Cecilia Abinadapa. Okay, so how many bank accounts have been frozen by so the Special Prosecutor? in all, we are looking at seven bank accounts. Seven bank accounts. And what types of accounts are we, are we, are we talking about here? Um, so, in some instances, the OSP indicates the kind of account. So, those that are with Prudential Bank, 
he indicates that they are current accounts. Current accounts. But those that are with Society General, he only indicates that they are accounts with the following account numbers. Okay. But we get the understanding, or we gather, that some of them are investment accounts. Investment accounts. Yes. So we have current accounts and then investment accounts. Now, for each of the accounts, there are some monies in there. We got a statement from the special uh, office of the special prosecutor this evening that monies that have been put out there purportedly to be the balances of these accounts are not coming from his office. That is to say, if there are any figures out there suggesting that there are the balances in these accounts, then he says that it is not he, the office of the special prosecutor, who has mm. put that out there. I see. It may well be coming from other sources. Okay. But there's some confirmation that there's some money in there. That's why he's actually even gone ahead to want to freeze it and, and gone to court to extend the period of the freezing of these accounts, correct? Yes. So, so when you look at the processes that the OSP filed before the court, um, you would see in the affidavit in support, which has been signed by one of the state attorneys, that they believe from all the circumstances that the money in this account, um, together with other monies that they have seized from her house, are subject of investigation considering the circumstances. Mind you, I already indicated that when you look at the OSP Act, Section 38, mm -hmm. 39, and then 40, they all talk about the freezing orders or the power of the OSP to freeze an account on suspicion or at the point of investigating somebody. Now we're already been told, as far back as 24th of July, Sisi Ladapa was put under arrest. She was granted bail. Investigations had started. So it I presupposes see. that then the account had to be frozen. frozen. But he has within 14 days to apply to the court to get that freezing order confirmed. I see. But we are now getting to know that these 14 days, there probably might be some calculation going on because the date for the hearing of this case is what? The, the 17th of August, which is next week, Thursday, exactly a week away from today. Yes. And, and that 14 days, if you're doing the calculation from the 26th uh, to, to the 17th, how, how will that play out, Dennis? So what it means is that you look at the day that the freezing order directed by the OSP took effect. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the affidavit, you would notice that the freezing order took effect on the 26th of July. Because when the OSP wrote the letter, the letter to the banks, which we have copies of, it indicated that it took immediate effect, and the letter was dated the 26th of July. So from 26th of July all through to um, the 8th of July, where the processes were filed, mm -hmm. and then the hearing will be on the 17th, I mean, 8th of August, where the processes were filed, mm -hmm. that's just two days ago, and then hearing will be on the 17th of July. It may well be outside of the 14 days. I now, see. many are asking the question because we have been here before. At a True. point where somebody's account was frozen, only for us to learn later that the person was able to do transactions because the processes that were supposed to be followed so that the person would not touch those accounts were not duly followed. So mm -hmm. that's the reason many are asking those questions as to whether the OSP can secure the accounts for as long as the process of getting that freezing order confirmed uh, uh, gets to that point. Thank you for, for taking us on a journey of how this case has obviously played out over the last few days gone by the evolution really really fast uh, a former united nations senior governance advisor professor bafo ajimendia is joining us on zoom prof thank you so much for staying up to to join us here on ghana tonight first of all i mean you you have described this cecilia the park case as a tragedy for government and the nation what are the specific governance issues that comes up with all what we have just been showing Well, it's because uh, the whole nation, uh, we're facing hard time. Our economy is not the best. That is an understatement in itself. Our economy is creeping. A lot of people are afraid that the economy might even collapse. And the government is making efforts that people don't see much about. And everybody's complaining about the inflation rate, the you know, and in the midst of all that, if it comes out that a senior public official is able to keep so much money 
in the house. And now we are hearing even additional, uh, we have an additional information about perhaps uh, more money in bank accounts and all. That really is a tragedy. That's why I said so, you know. First, there's a high public perception of corruption in this country. Of course, that is not new in itself. But I think under this government, the public has not seen any substantive statements and policies towards addressing corruption. Of course, we are aware of the establishment of certain institutions to fight corruption. But when it comes to human behavior and actions, we scarcely hear official condemnation or rebuke. And it truly, this particular case has not, or perhaps as you say, is yet to receive official rebuke. And that makes people angry. And that is why I think the amount mentioned officially as having been stolen and the additional money that apparently has been discovered, all that has up to create a huge tragedy for us. I see, but you see, Prof, Professor Jumanduya, in, in other progressive jurisdictions, when such incidents happen, you see some response mechanism to ensure that it doesn't happen again. You made reference to the response by the president when this happened. We, 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 we would have seen amendment of laws to make it stronger or the institution new laws or, or as to a strengthening systems. All of that is not happening. What we are seeing is, is, is a lot of talk and the, some defense of what has happened. And then another scandal happens. Then it goes on and on and on. What has to change? Precisely. You see, when governments, and not only this government, I remember previous governments saying the same, oh, we have created this institution, we have done this. But institutions by themselves do not work. It is the kind of people you put in charge of institutions that make institutions work, at least to our satisfaction. So that for me is not the answer. And even if that's a, an answer, it's a partial answer. What we need to see is action by government against those who are found to be corrupt. That's why in this particular case, the case we are discussing, Madam Cecilia, the past case, I was a little bit disturbed that initially there was no official response until she resigned. And even then, accepting the resignation, the statement that was given was not encouraging at all. I seek to suggest that in the end, the culprit will be found not guilty. And that didn't sit well with many Ghanaians. It didn't show some kind of urgency and seriousness on the part of government regarding corruption or theft cases. Of course, we are yet to get a verdict from the courts, if in fact the case goes to the court for us to know uh, whether is guilty or not, but at least, as I like to say, the optics are low. Should have informed the government to take a more strident uh, uh, position in terms of statements in distancing itself from such an action, even before she is declared guilty or not guilty. And that lethargy on the part of government in responding to cases of corruption and creating impression as if such cases are needless or they are not true and all, tends to reinforce the public perception that in fact, perhaps very senior officials uh, condone uh, such uh, actions or such practices. And I think the government could have done itself better I see. if okay. there had been swift reaction. And we are hoping that the Office of uh, Special Prosecution, the OSP, uh, I think this is a real test test case for him. It's a real test case. Mm -hmm. And already people are even raising some questions. Attempts by the Attorney General to get into the case, the, the yes. police connection to all this. And I'm hoping that the OSP will stand firm and demonstrate. Demonstrate the principle 
that he so beautifully enunciated when he was interviewed at length on Joy mm. News some weeks, several weeks ago. He was very convincing when he spoke on television. And for me, I still maintain some confidence in him that he can do the job. But as I say, it's a real test case for us to see if, in fact, he's capable of prosecuting <laughs> big so, fishes. So, so, so for you, you align with those who make the point that the president's even going ahead to say that integrity was going to be restored, even before investigation started into this case, was bad for the optics and certainly bad for whatever outcome of this investigation that is going on, is it not? I said so. I said so. Uh, and I think, as I keep saying, this is a real test case, not only for the OSP, but for the government at large. Because this could be the most scandalous case we have had in a long time. Scandalous because when a senior official is capable of storing such an amount in the house, only God knows how much that person has elsewhere. And as you know, most officials in this country, most African countries, have tendency to save their money abroad. And if it's one government person doing this, I don't know how many other officials are indulging in that. I'm not saying there's no case against anybody, but these, this case leads us to speculate, which perhaps is unnecessary, but the reaction of government do not encourage us uh, not to do that. That's why I think there's a loud uh, voice coming from civil society uh, on this matter. So, again, right. let us see what right. the OSP can Okay, Prof, but on that, on that bit of the suspicion, right, that, that suspicion that you're talking about, that uh, this is Cecilia Dapa case, as many have said, it may be just at the tip of the iceberg of a very bigger situation that we don't know of because nothing has happened. Maybe their house helps having stolen whatever money they are keeping in their bedrooms. But this brings up a bigger conversation about the asset declaration regime of public officers in this country and the weaknesses in there, is it not? Obviously. And it is sickening that both parties, when they are in power, they literally ignore called by civil society to rewrite the asset declaration as it is in the constitution. It has no teeth. All it requires public officials to do is to declare their assets quietly. And when it's declared, nobody knows. And then you give it to the accountant or auditor general, push it under lock. You serve the government or the country for four years or eight years, you walk away. Nobody tells you what the, the declaration was. Absolutely useless. So if we are serious to check public officials behaving this way, then I think the access declaration should be strengthened by revising it and perhaps requiring periodic review of the declaration and periodic declaration of public officials. For instance, if the holding authority is authorized to open the declaration after two years or three years, call the uh, person and start interviewing the person, what else has happened since you were employed, if the addition you added, if there's nothing, and then that will help us to know exactly what. Right. Of course, mind you, people are still clever these days about stealing state assets. They put names on them, people front for them. We know that it's been going on for decades. Hmm. Public officials uh, allow people to front for them. But all of these can be done if, in fact, we attach investigation to, to the, the assets, that, assets are that are declared by public officers. Very important call there. Professor Bafo Ajimendia is a former United Nations governance advisor, also an expert in that area. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. But coming up next, the bank, in, the bank of Ghana is saying that its current head office building, which was built in the 1960s, by the Nkrumah government has failed a structural integrity assessment that's coming up next here 
on Ghana tonight. And uh, we're getting to all of those. Plus, the IMF statement also coming through right now has been responding to the Bank of Ghana losses. We will tell you about it right after this quick break here on Ghana tonight. There's been some responses as well. Stay with us. We will be back shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Oh, Jam, you're looking good, oh, my friend. Is that something you're not telling me? Yes, I'm feeling very good and strong. What is the secret? It is not a secret. My farmer used Yara Miller Activa on me two weeks after planting. This boosted my growth. Then after, he used Yara Bella Sulfan as top dressing when I was at knee length. My goodness and strength is because of Yara Miller Activa and Yara Bella Sulfan. Yara fertilizers are pre fertilizers that are readily available for plant upkeep and do not over acidify the soil. Yara fertilizers also contain micronutrients such as zinc, boron and manganese, which aid in yield and crop quality. If you want to look good like me, then your farmer must go for Yara fertilizers. They are available in accredited agri-input shops nationwide. For more information, call 0308-251-060 or visit our webpage at yara.com.gh or Facebook page. And there is more. Yara retailers can also benefit from selling Yara products by just downloading Yara Connect app and scanning QR codes on the Yara sack at the point of sale. To end rewards, use Yara fertilizers for better yield and quality produce. What does winning mean to you? For Yao, it's seeing the joy in his mother's eyes after he provided her with a state-of-the-art kitchen to cook her signature Unapu Jolof. It's a mega win. For Ajua, it's turning her passion for photography into a successful career while providing her children with the best education possible. It's a mega win. For Kwame, it's becoming his own boss and starting his music business. It's a mega win. Whatever winning means to you, Mega 6 Lotto can help you achieve it in grand style. With only 49 numbers to choose from, the odds are always in your favor. Play with as little as two Ghana CDs for a chance to win millions of CDs every week. Download our Android and iOS apps. Dial star 266 hash or visit mega6loto.com to make a mega impact on your life and the lives of others. Mega 6 Loto. Mega winnings, mega impact. The Mega 6 Lotto is regulated and monitored by the NLA. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. Who will be careful M Punch Wana? Ha! That's
This week on Ghana's Most Beautiful, join the contestants as they embrace the celebrations theme. Be ready to be inspired, moved and captivated by their heartfelt performances, paying tribute to Ghana's vibrant cultural celebrations that define its heart and soul. Mama don't miss this extraordinary celebration live on TV3 this Sunday at 8 p.m. Eviction is looming. Keep your contestant in the competition by dialing star 713 star 13 hash to vote or download the TV3 reality app to vote. GMB 2023, Ghana's beauty. Africa's pride. GMB 2023 is sponsored by Gino Tomato Mix, GTP, Techno Common 20 Series, AT, Pepsodent Charcoal and Lemon Infused Formula and Pepsodent Natural Herbal Formula, Geisha Moringa and Geisha Black Soup, Key Soup, Bell Pack Tissues, Sankofa Natural Spices, Vita Milk, Deluxe Acrylic Paint, Nescofa Blood Tonic, Heaven Black Mosquito Spray and Coil, Enapa Foods, Free Freedom from Casa Preco, Frutelli Calipo, Duffy's Health and Beauty, Obuasi Bites, Nubna Womuankasa, Dragnet, Top Choku, Global Wings Travel and Tour. Makeup was done by House of Tara. Welcome back. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, the Bank of Ghana says its current head office building, which was built in the 1960s by the Nkrumah government, has failed a structural integrity assessment. That is their justification for the spending of some $250 million on that said amount, that, that particular building. Now, Take a look at this, and this is what we do know so far uh, as to the building that you're talking about. And you're going to see on the screen right now, the new Bank of Ghana headquarters, which uh, the minority NDC made reference to two days ago. The cost of that building now we know that has been put out is some $250 million. Now, that's the new building there, and it's, it's if you describe it as springing up, quite fast, you will not be wrong, uh, because if you've been monitoring the pace of progress of this said building, you can understand why questions have been raised about it. But the Bank of Ghana, in their justification of why they are building this particular facility, is that, quote, the, this building, the old building they are in now, is no longer fit for purpose and could not stand any major earth tremor, right? And that's why they are doing this, that they, they're building this new, new head office. Now, they issued a statement detailing why they are doing this. And I'm going to put portions of that statement on the screen right now. This is the Bank of Ghana saying so. The Bank of Ghana statement indicating that, one, this is not fit for purposes. The outcome of the structural integrity work was that the main building does not satisfy the full complement of excess strength required for a building to be considered safe for usage. Two, this means that in the case of a worst case gravity and wind loading scenario, for example, unusually strong wind, the building may be significantly affected. It goes on to say that the, unlike the current Bank of Ghana head office building built by the Nkrumah government in the early 1960s. The new head office cannot stand major earth tremors. That's why they are building this new facility. And Professor John Gachi is the dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School. Prof, this is, this is the latest response from the Bank of Ghana on the justification why they are building this new facility for this much. Does this answer the critical questions that have been raised about this venture that they are on? Uh, people have problem with uh, the Bank of Ghana putting up a new building befitting and structurally adequate for their occupation. But the problem is at what time are they putting it when they are making a loss of 60 billion? When they have spent all the money to clear the mess of government, 
Is that a period that they are doing this? That is the question that people are asking. And at the same time, people are asking about the cost. Why is it 250 uh, I mean, I mean million? What are they building? So it is their duty to explain those things. So it's not as if uh, people are saying that the building of Bank of Ghana, you cannot build. No. If there is a technical report that indicates the Bank of Ghana should be recruited to a better and more fortified building, that is not a problem. But the amount you are spending, is, 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 is it proper? The time you are spending it, is it proper? Are we in exigency? If we're in, indeed in exigency, why will you stop lending to gov a government only after an IMF uh, stoppage? So if the Bank of Ghana were not to take it upon themselves that they were set up just to be clearing the mess of government, we will not be in this situation. So that is what the public is pointing out to them, and they must live up to that. I believe the least they should be telling the public is that the losses they can turn around and begin to make profit and begin to be stable. As we are speaking, the Bank of Ghana needs capitalization. As we are speaking, the Bank of Ghana, the audit report shows that its going concern is in question. But they are saying that they, they have what they are called policy solvency. So, that financial so, uh, insolvency is not a problem. That they have what they call policy solvency. The time that this crisis started we're having exchange rates of six cities to the dollar what do we have at the exchange rate few 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 months ago when the audit was conducted inflation when the mm -hmm. crisis started when what was inflation inflation was uh, near single digits but it rose up, up to 54%. Now it is 43%. All right. Hmm. Professor Gachi, and, and, and thank you, because you made reference to the other aspects of this statement and the explanation or justification for this over 60 billion CDs loss in their books as at the end of 2022. There is a development now. The IMF has spoken. Let's go on to the IMF website right now. This is what is, is there. This is what the IMF has published with respect to why the Bank of Ghana incurred losses from the authorities, domestic data exchange, and what are their implications. What you're seeing on the screen right now is live on the IMF website. The Ghanaian authorities' domestic debt exchange is a key element of their plan to restore macroeconomic stability and public debt sustainability. The Bank of Ghana is participating in the DDE to share some of the burden the DDE places on government debt holders, along with banks, other financial institutions, pension funds, and individuals. So look at the number of people. In fact, the categories of persons and institutions that are affected by the DDEP. And that should tell you the quantum of impact and, and the extent of this DDEP we're talking about. Pension funds, individuals, other financial institutions, banks, and now the Bank of Ghana. The IMF says... The loss the BOG incurred in the process has contributed to reducing its net equity to a negative value. Importantly, however, this does not prevent the Bank of Ghana from fulfilling its policy mandate and ensuring inflation gradually returns towards its 8% target. Indeed, central bank income is expected to be sufficient to cover monetary policy operations operational costs, and that's what Professor Gachi made reference to. The BOG's net equity is expected to improve significantly over the time and eventually return to, let's say, positive uh, territory. And they have actually gone ahead to caution the Bank of Ghana, highlighting the importance of upholding its policy mandate despite the financial setback uh, experience in the fiscal year 2022. So, they have charged the Bank of Ghana, regardless of this, to tame inflation 
and that this over 60 billion cities loss is not an excuse to shake its policy mandate. So that's coming from the IMF, and that's what you see there published on the IMF's website. When you go on there, uh, you would uh, get to know the details of the report there. Professor Godfrey Bobkin is a professor of finance at the University of Ghana. He had also something to share with respect to this point that the IMF has made in response to what's happening at the Bank of Ghana. Take a look. The law is made for others. Okay. And therefore, in terms of how we respect the law, has some kind of levels. Uh, and I agree with um, a senior economist here. I respect him a lot. Um, it was very clear to me from the third quarter of 2021, and if you check the trajectory, you will see that our poster changed how we saw government and government policy, especially from the third quarter of 2021. Our conclusion, I wasn't the only person, together with the money guys, by Simmons and the others, that look, Ghana was heading dangerously, that something needed to be done. Okay. And we felt that the optimal time for us to have reached out to the IMF was actually from the third quarter of 2021. You want to look at the fiscal vulnerabilities, you want to look at the measures you had put in place, you want to look at how COVID, how we monetized COVID. Right. I'm saying that we commercialize the virus. Okay. So the abuse and all of that, coupled with 2020, 2020 election, it was very clear. And also because we had been there before. You look at how we operationalized the 2012 election and the fiscal deficit after the 2012 election. The deficit was more than 12%, around 12.1%. The current account deficit was in double digits, right? In fact, this money printing didn't start today. It didn't start today. No. And just as Mr. Pien said, you know, for, for inflation targeting, which we had adopted mm -hmm. during the time of Dr. Paul Aqua, okay, unofficially, we started inflation targeting March 2002, mm -hmm. officially 2007. That's Professor Godfrey Bopin there. you find more of it on 3news.com. And that was at the 3 Business TV3 Leadership and Economic Forum organized yesterday. And you find more of it on 3news.com. Coming up next, the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, has ordered immediate activation of standby forces in Niger after the sub-regional bloc held a meeting in Abuja earlier today. We have our sources close to this meeting earlier today, giving us indications of what next. In fact, news just coming through is that the Ivory Coast President Alhazan Ouattara has also indicated that the country will contribute 1,000 troops to the ECOWAS standby force for the Niger operation. That is what is just coming through minutes ago. And uh, this also has been a question that many have been asking that would it be prudent for President Kofuado to commit Ghanaian troops to this Niger situation. Now, the likes of uh, also Johnson Isidun Ketia, the chair of the NDC, has been sharing his thoughts on this. Now we know uh, the Ivory Coast has committed troops about Ghana. This is Johnson Esedu Ketia. Take a look. A reckless experiment. We shouldn't go for military intervention now. They should look at the military interventions all over the world and tell me the end state. So I don't think that we should rush into any military intervention. We should be looking for the causes of these military interventions and address them. What is happening across the Sahel is bigger than uh, just a small military intervention. Any military intervention will be aimed at dealing with the symptoms rather than the causes of the disease itself. I believe that it has a lot to do with France's new colonial policy and that is why in all the 506 cases, it is about French-speaking 
uh, colony. So we should look at it again. That's the chairman of the NDC, Johnson Isidu Ketia there. Mutaru Mumuni Mufta is the executive director of the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism. He has been monitoring the meeting of the ECOWAS leaders in Abuja earlier today. He's joining us on Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. First of all, we're just learning that, in fact, the Ivory Coast has committed 1,000 troops to this uh, ECOWAS standby force, which we understand an order has been given for its deployment. How is this going to impact on how things are playing out in, in Niger? The resolution that we have heard from ECOWAS today, uh, in my opinion, appears unhelpful, unhelpful in the sense that ECOWAS appears to be talking about diplomatic approach and dialogue, uh, diplomatic negotiations to dealing with this problem. And at the same time, they are threatening you know, the use of military intervention to deal with the situation. If you remember, the first announcement that they did on the 30th of July, uh, it included this option. And the aftermath of that, the discussions around it, including officials of ECOWAS, use of military intervention, even though they refer to it as the last option. And so for me today, it appears they have escalated you know, the challenges relating to dealing with the Nigerian situation by emphasizing the use of military approach to dealing with the situation. They have gone beyond just generally saying they would resort to military approach to actually asking for the immediate, you know, activation of the ECOWAS standby force, which in my opinion does not help in terms of negotiations and dealing with the military leadership in Niger. And so we need to look at it, you know, walk away from this path of threat and the use of military intervention as a threat to get the military leaders to succumb to the directives of ECOWAS. Otherwise, this is not going to be helpful in terms of the negotiations that they are seeking to have with the military leadership in place. I see. But then there is also that other concern about uh, how especially this decision would also influence the posture that the military leadership in Niger will take because we're learning also that the military leadership in Niger declined a meeting with a delegation of ECOWAS, United Nations and the AU earlier in the week as well. So what has to give for some kind of trust to be developed so that they can even have a meeting with a delegation from the United Nations, which you are not even giving a hearing to. That's the thing wrong. With the inclusion of the option of the military intervention. And so clearly, if you're dealing with a party that on one hand, you're asking for negotiation or dialogue, a peaceful process to resolve in a situation. And at the same time, you are threatening the use of force. It does not uh, feature the element of good faith and trust in the process. Yesterday, we were monitoring, our system was monitoring what was going on in Niger, and our intelligence picked up uh, the fact that there was a flight from Abuja uh, destined, you know, to land in Niger. They got into Niger, but did not get permission to land. And so late morning, they spent some time within the airspace of Niger, and they were, you know, made to return back to Nigeria. And this is not the first time they had refused to meet with a delegation made up of OICOWAS, AU, and UN. And it's largely because of the initial approach to dealing with the situation. The leadership in place in Niger do not trust, you know, that there's good faith in the way and manner that this negotiation is being constructed. And so it's going to be a huge you know, complex situation to dialogue with the military leadership in place. And the, the worst situation is that we may have a military deployment in Niger. And from where I sit, this can be very ugly for all of us. I do not see uh, a resolution through the use of military intervention. And so there's a need for us to kind of, you know, summon the new spirit in terms of approach to dealing with it, an approach that walks away from the military the threat of military intervention in Niger and involve, you know, legitimate voices within the region and, you know, international levels to ensure that we have 
you know, an amicable solution to this. It is not going to be easy. It's not going to be, you know, come very quick. But we do. We must do everything we can to ensure that we avoid a military, uh, a, a military situation or military intervention uh, in dealing with this problem. And I say that from the perspective, if you look at the context and the background to, you know, the security situation in the sub-region, we are in a very ugly situation right now in terms of regional security, in terms of stability, and in terms of the big problem of terrorism and violent extremism in the region. And so we have to do everything we can so that we do not further worsen the situation in which I, I we see. are right now. But, but Muftar, before I let you go, the, we're just learning now that uh, the Ivory Coast President Hassan Ouattara has uh, committed 1,000 troops to this standby force of uh, ECOWAS in, uh, to Niger. And Burkina Faso, which says borders with Ivory Coast, is also supporting the leadership of the military in Niger. Where does Ghana now stand? What would be your recommendation in this instance? Uh, that our president will commit to this nation to any kind of military intervention, any kind of war situation. I do not think that our president would do that. Of course, people are calling on our president not to do that. But in the first place, I do not think that the thinking uh, within the Flagstaff House is that we would support the military process in terms of committing our troops and resources. We are already in a very dire situation in terms of the economic situation here and in terms of regional security. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, if anything at all, officially, we should be uh, restraining ECOWAS from going the path of military okay. intervention. Right. And I think that um, we are watching to see in the next couple of days what, what the official position happen. of government would be. Indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, Muktao Momoni uh, is the, with the uh, executive director of the West African Center for Counter Extremism, uh, also joining us with his thoughts on this. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, the National Disaster Management Organization has issued a flash flood warning to residents in and around the northeast region of the country, cautioning them to be ready to move to higher grounds following floods earlier today and uh, that's the detail that we have right now is going to be on the screen shortly because the northeast regional secretariat of nadmo has issued a statement this evening advising the population around the northeast region to be on the alert and be ready to move to higher grounds following the flash floods that occurred this morning nadmo northeast region is, says they are monitoring the situation and work, working with other agencies such as regional coordinating council, municipal and district assemblies, security agencies and other agencies to ensure prompt response to any emergency as well as issue regular updates uh, on the situation so that everybody will be advised accordingly. This happened earlier today. The videos you are seeing right now are from some of our viewers in the northeast region. Uh, given us updates of the level of devastation that the floods have caused the area. All road users traveling to Narugu, especially Narugu, from other parts of the region and beyond are advised to be cautious as a bridge between Tinguri and Bani have also collapsed. The Nazia, Perigu and Mimima road has also been affected by the heavy floods and are not accessible so that's why you see people being carried across the rivers and these are the, this is one of the bridges we understand that has been uh, destroyed and we understand that the dangers of the floods and the flash flooding is just just six inches of moving water can knock you down and most vehicles will begin to float losing control and possibly stalling about 12 inches of moving water can also sweep a vehicle away. And that's what we're seeing now. So this is just for the caution of people who are moving into the Northeast region and the residents in there as well. Stay with us here across all media general platforms because we, we're keeping a close eye on what's happening in the region and we'll be updating you as the days go by. Thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana Tonight. Join us same time tomorrow. I am Alfred Okonsi. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage, simple.